Hello, 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 hello. Welcome to Mentorship Mondays, guys. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. And it's the first time that we actually are managing to do this on our Mentorship Monday page. So really excited about that. Um, I'm going to take a couple of minutes because I know that um, there might be a few people who are still joining us. So let me say hi to uh, Cindy Swa and Mandisa uh, and Wale and uh, Fifi Graham uh, has joined us. Uh, Sane Kulu, say hi to you. Uh, my dear friend, the Black Mermaid, nice to see you. Amanda Green, welcome. Laura. Megan or Megan? I never know when I see uh, that name. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, Laura. Uh, thank you so much guys for being here we're going to give it a few more minutes because this is the first time on our mentorship monday page exactly so um we might have a few people who are just still figuring out where we are uh oman chingila hello nice to nice to see you here diva on the move wow uh what what a name i love it uh while you just uh n underscore wale i hope i'm saying that uh correctly you're abs absolutely welcome we are so excited uh, to be having this session and I'm so excited to share uh, some of my thoughts uh, today with all of you. Khums is here. I would imagine that's Khumuto in full. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Flo, um, TZ Kimati. So I would imagine that's uh, in Tanzania, Flo, uh, confirmed for us, but hello, hello. Um, hello to you, so lovely to have, here, have you. And then Damase uh has joined us and i must say i know to be a surname so i'd love to know who uh what your real name is all right so we're gonna get started because i know we only have an hour um allow me to say firstly thank you thank you thank you for being here we uh, we've moved on to our uh, mentorship monday page we're gonna try and grow the followership here we're gonna try and separate you know my personal uh page from this community that is are growing uh, so much. Oh, Khum says it's Mahumu. Oh, that's great. I've got a friend called uh, Mahumu, but we call her Max uh, for short. Um, so we're going to try and separate these communities. So thank you so much for being the first ones on this platform, the first ones on this community uh, to get us going. So typically on Mentorship Mondays, what we do is that we, we always invite a guest and the guest is somebody that we consider to be a master mentor, a person who is doing phenomenal things in the world. Uh, this year, we're all about identifying and shining the spotlight on Africans who are doing amazing things on the global stage. Guys, please excuse that. That's my son. He's just finishing his supper and he, he doesn't know how to keep quiet yet. Um, so we are focusing on Africans who are doing amazing things on the global stage. But every now and then, you're going to have me. Um, and that's in moments when I feel like I have something that's really burning that I want to get off my chest and I want to share with you guys. Not because I think I'm the only mentor in the world. Absolutely not. I mean, the whole concept of Mentorship Monday is about all of us mentoring each other. Um, but sometimes um, it's good to share. And also we'd love to hear some of your recommendations about who would you like to hear from? Who would you like us to invite onto Mentorship Monday so that you can you can connect uh, with them and that they can mentor you. So today I thought a really good place to start the conversation is actually to talk about how to lead yourself before you lead others. And I often find that we miss the step in us trying to influence others, in us trying to build businesses where we're leading others, whether we're in, uh, in corporate roles or in the public sector, we have this anticipation that because we have been put in a leadership uh, position or we find ourselves in a leadership position that automatically we have the know-how uh, to lead other people and i often find that it gets easier to lead other people if you at first understand how to lead yourself because in the struggles that you have to lead yourself it gives you an empathetic muscle and an empathetic ability to to kind of have the sense of what are the challenges that others might be facing as you try to lead them as you try to lead them to professional breakthroughs and as you try to lead them to personal breakthroughs as well and so i think it's super important that we always start at zero so let me say hello i see a few more people are joining in uh so Kathy, hi dineo dineo two dineos uh bianca Marcia, thank you so much guys for being here. We're talking about uh, today 
uh, the, the importance of knowing how to lead yourself before you even build the muscle or the expectation to lead others. And Tapo is saying such a great conversation. What I found is that the introduction of leadership usually happens when it's concerned with others. We never really look and promote self-leadership. That's 100% right. We, I mean, I think the longest definition of leadership has been about there's a leader and there's a follower, right? And oftentimes we miss that we could be both those things ourselves. Um, and, the, and the big question we should be asking ourselves is, would I follow me? You know, would I allow myself to be led by me? And I think that's a fundamental um, question that I want us to get to um, today. So what did I do? I went to go and, you know, think a little bit about this, read up a little bit about it, and then came up with what I would say would be four things or four pillars we've got to think about as we try to improve our ability to lead ourselves. And I really want to encourage, say hi, nice to see you. I'd really like to encourage you guys to send me comments and questions as we go along. Um, but I'm going to share um, what I think is important in terms of how to lead oneself. Some of it is lessons that I've learned along the way. Some of it is things that I'm still struggling with personally and I need to figure it out because the, the, the thing about self-leadership is that it never ends. It's not like you tick it off on the box and go, oh, okay, cool, um, I'm done. Now I'm off to lead others. We're constantly in the process. We're constantly on the journey of learning how to lead ourselves better. So to simplify it, I want us to think about four pillars um, of leading oneself. So the first pillar is self-discovery. We're going to talk a little bit about that. The second pillar is self-acceptance. The third pillar is self-management. And the fourth pillar is self-growth. So it's really nice, um, uh, uh, you know, catchy little phrases. I picked up these phrases from uh, a, a, a platform called Mogul, M-O-G-U-L, where they, they post a lot of stuff around um, leadership more broadly. But I thought this was a really useful framework to think about how do we begin to lead ourselves more um, effectively. Uh, my first says, um, Self-leadership starts with self-knowledge, and that's exactly right, because the first pillar is self-discovery. So I've got my notes here. I'm going to pull, pull them closer. And I'm going to try and unpack each of these pillars. So the first pillar, which is self-discovery, you cannot lead something that you do not know. If you don't know your people, we're always taught this, whether it's in business school, with leadership seminars, in corporate settings, whatever it is, that you've got to know your people in order to lead them well. And that's why, you know, when they talk about leading in diverse settings, you are encouraged as a leader to understand how the young person in your team is maybe going to react differently to a slightly older person. And so these nuances of knowing people allows us to lead them better. It's the exact same thing when it comes to ourselves. Do you know yourself enough to be able to lead yourself effectively? And I, I, I can see how many of us could go, oh yeah, but I do know myself. I mean, I know myself better than anyone. But do we really? So one of the practices that we can, um, I'm just going to pin Zappos comment here so I don't lose it. One of the practices that we can introduce to our, in our lives in order to get to know ourselves even better is the practice of reflection. Now, what reflection is, is not sitting there and going, hmm, I'm reflecting on the day. No, reflection is about asking yourself hard, difficult questions at the end of each day. Uh, and sometimes even at the, the beginning of the day, if you go into a reflective space, it allows you to uh, manifest how you want your day to play out. So here's an example. If you go out and you deliver something for a client, for your boss, for whatever the context may be, the, the discipline of pausing at the end of that, at the end of the day, at the end of that delivery and being honest with yourself about how did I do? Just that question. How did I, how did I do? Um, if this was somebody else, how would I rate how they've done? What could I have done better? And having, and this is not just about asking the questions and saying them out loud. It's about being super honest about the responses to those questions. What could I have done better? Where did I, where did I, where did I miss, uh, miss the plot? Where did I miss my focus? Where did I lose track of what I was supposed to be doing? 
so that that you raising your consciousness um so that you get to know the things that stand in the way of you becoming the person that you would follow in a heartbeat and of course the idea is that once you ask yourself the question what could have i done better as an example is that you take that answer that you give to yourself and you institute it into the next thing that you're going to do so you're using your own um cycle of feedback to get to know yourself better here's another simple question something happens doesn't even have to be a project there's a conversation that happens in the office or that happens among with your friends even and you feel some type of way do you go back and ask yourself why did i feel like that where was that feeling coming from why was i triggered in that way or why was i annoyed by that comment and it is in those little things that we actually invite ourselves to keep um peeling off the layers of ourselves so if you think about yourself as an onion when you go into a reflective state you keep peeling back the layers um and getting to know yourself even better so much so that it allows you to be proactive in certain situations where you walk in knowing that eh this situation i know it's going to irritate me or i know it's going to annoy me and so you already beginning to manage how you're going to react because you know that in a certain um circumstances or certain situation there are certain things that are going to trigger you in a particular way so you go there not to be flat-footed and surprised as if you didn't know it was going to happen but you go knowing that i i know this is what's going to happen so let me manage um how i'm going to react to it this time okay so let me just read a couple of comments um so Nsapo's uh, comment here saying I work with graduates and one of the things I always prompt them about leadership is how do you lead yourself as a student a team member or even a group member it always starts with the small things and I couldn't agree with you more and look there are also um tools that people are using to get to know themselves better so if we think about all the diagnostic and psycho uh, 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 uh like this um um uh we call them uh, what do we call them um black personality uh type tests uh we call them psychometrics that's the english word um all of these psychometric tests they do often also allow you to get to know yourself better now i know some people might roll their eyes and go oh yeah no psychometric tests they're just trying to put us in a box and um i'm 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 more than what a psychometric test tells me i am and you know what i actually agree with you what i have found and i've done a few psychometric tests is that there's certain elements that i take out of those psychometric tests that things that surprise me about myself but when when they they shared back with me actually makes so much sense so here's an example i once did a psychometric test i think it was the myers briggs test and one of the things that came out of that test was that i have a high freedom score i was like what's a high freedom score i've never heard of a high anybody having a high freedom score in 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 my life and a high freedom score basically means that i don't like doing things when i where i don't feel that i have the freedom to make the decision to take ownership to be completely creative in the way that i want to be and as a result of that i don't do well um with reporting into people whose authority and credibility i don't respect and so it makes sense that i have gravitated towards entrepreneurship it makes sense that i live my life in such a way that i probably only need to consult my husband um about decisions that i'm making because my need to feel that my world is a canvas that i can shape and draw is so important to me and i didn't know that it also makes sense because of the guy that i married i couldn't have married somebody who was dictatorial who tried you know put me in a box try to you know expect me to be something i want to be anything and everything all at the same time and so when i heard that when it was articulated to me in words that you have a high freedom score i was like that makes sense so my point is this around the first pillar of um uh self discovery is practice reflection it's really important and ask yourself the difficult questions did i do okay could i have done better why am i reacting this way why am i hurt don't just accept that when something hurts you that i it hurts 
Why? Why does it hurt you when it doesn't seem to be hurting everybody else? Why does it anger you? Where does that come from? Remember to think about yourself as a, an onion where you have a constant invitation to pull back the layers to get to know yourself better. Um, don't shy away from these psychometric tests. Um, oftentimes, little gems and insights about ourselves are hidden in these things and we can find out more about ourselves. So in addition to finding out that I have a high freedom score, I also did the strengths find a test, which I've told everybody about. And I really, really, um, in fact, it was almost a validation that I needed something scientific to validate what I felt in my gut. Um, and that is actually very simply beyond speaking well, I know that I can do. I'm actually a fantastic teacher. I teach really well, but I never knew, I, I never had somebody, you know, articulate that for me. You know, when I was in high school, uh, I remember prepping for our metric exams. My friends and I would sit at break and after school and I would teach them the same thing that we were teaching together. When I was in university, when I was in my third year, I was tutoring first years. And so it's something I've always gravitated towards, including doing this because it sets my spirit on fire. But I needed somebody to remind me that I have that within me uh, and to say it to me in words that could make sense for me to be able to live into it. So that's the first pillar and that's the pillar of uh, self-discovery and it's super, super important. As I was reading on self-discovery before I moved on, move on, many of the articles were saying, if you were put on the spot, somebody literally put a boot to your neck and they said, what are your values? And we often roll our, our eyes at these things and we go, ah, who's going to ask me about my values? But you know, it's, 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 those are the conversations with self that lead you to an intimacy with self. Do I understand the things that I value more than others? Do I understand the things that are my non-negotiables that, um, if threatened, um, you know, that person would see the worst of me. Do I understand where, what my pain sources are? What sits beneath my iceberg? Do I understand what my dreams, my hates, my loves are? Um, and you know, one of the things that my husband always talks about is that, you know, um, a good relationship is formed by having shared dreams, shared hates and shared loves. And it doesn't have to be all at the same time. But you know, if you can't, if you don't know what you hate when a self, and you don't know what you love, you don't know what you dream about, how much more when you are now expected to share that with somebody else. So quick side story. I remember um, dating some guy in university many years ago. And uh, after I broke up with him, or oh, while we were dating, we used to watch movies all the time. And we used to go to Stair Clinical. I think it was Tuesdays. We used to do the five rand movies. I can't remember. But we used to go to Stair Clinical on that day of the week because the movies were so cheap. And after we broke up, I actually stopped and I asked myself, I'm like, do I even like movies? Like, do I even like going to the movies? Because I don't know, like we're doing this thing because that's what we were doing in, in the relationship. And I just think it's important to have those hard conversations with yourself to be very clear about what do you like? What do you hate? What did you dream about? And it's the absolute foundation of actually um, beginning to lead yourself. Bianca's laughing at me because, you know, um, um, I'm going to read your, your message. My husband's call. Please, can you give me a thumbs up if you can still hear me? Now you see I even have a different filter. I've got all of these things now um, popping up all over my face. Hey, this guy. Okay, can you give me, uh, give me a thumbs up if you can still hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so I'm going to keep it, I'm going to keep it moving. So, yeah, so there's just all of these things, you know, um, uh, like, I don't even know if I like movies, you know, out there I was watching movies every, every week. And it's little things like that, that I think sometimes we just forget, you know, who we are in, in, in the bigger scheme of things. Um, uh, somebody in the story says it's important to honor your inner voice and that's it. I, I think that's really, really important and, and, and just having the discipline to listen to it. Khoite is saying, how do we hold ourselves accountable as we lead ourselves? I tend to procrastinate a lot 
and I change my timelines just because I'm the one in the leadership role as well. Oh my gosh, that's so important. And I think it lead, that's pillar number three. We'll talk about it under pillar number three, which is self-management, holding yourself accountable and doing the things that you said you're going to do when you said you were going to do them, not for anybody else, but for yourself. So let's go to guys. Now I hit this filter. Hey, you know, yes, uh, guys, now I'm sitting here with the funny filter because um, of this call that came through. Anyway, so that was the first pillar. The second pillar is self-acceptance. And I think this one is so, 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 so important. You cannot, you cannot practice self-acceptance unless you're being honest. You have to be honest with yourself. And so, for example, when you are reflecting and asking yourself if you could have done better on something and you lie to yourself and you say, oh my gosh, that was absolutely perfect and everything that went wrong was somebody else's fault, what that does is that it stands in the way of you, one, acknowledging your gaps and your shortfalls and the opportunity to grow and not accepting that you're not good at that thing yet, right? And so I think self-acceptance starts with honesty because when you're honest about the things you're not good at, I think it's really easy to practice self-acceptance in the things we're really good at, right? Because you, you quickly want to talk about, oh, I'm great at this, I'm great at that, I know I can do this, I know I could do that. But what about the things you're not good at? And the extent to which you accept that that is part of your makeup. And unless you accept that those things are part of your makeup, the likelihood that you're going to do something about them is actually going to be very thin. And so... I think self-acceptance is both about balancing your strengths and your weaknesses, your likes and your dislikes. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, oh, I wanna see if I, 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 I'll give you an example. I hate Excel with my whole life. Like, absolutely hate it. And I'm not good at it. Um, I, I just, I don't know. I, don't, I feel like I skipped the lectures where we were supposed to learn Excel, my first uh, degrees were in political sciences and international relations. We never learned how to pivot a table um, and all of these fancy things that people do on Excel. The first time I actually had to now get serious about Excel and I couldn't now run away from it was when I started working. And this thing used to trap me all the time. And I'm seeing people doing formulas and people dropping down and doing this and doing this. And eventually I was like, okay, cool. I just need to learn this thing so I can be over it. And I, I you know, went through the process of learning how to just do the basics on Excel. And I needed to be honest with myself that I know how to do it, but I'm still not good at it. And I still hate it. So um, if you come into my team, you will notice hardly anything is on Excel with, ex with the exception of, uh, of our accounts. And even then, I'm not even the one who's managing that. I can now read and make sense of what's happening on an Excel spreadsheet because I have to. I mean, I, I have to be able to read uh, financial accounts and all of those things. But I'm, I'm not good at it. I'm not good at it. And being able to accept that from the get-go is really, really important. And so I think the, 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 the practice of self-acceptance rooted in honesty and humility is probably the second layer that gets us to better manage ourselves. You can't improve something that you haven't accepted you're not good at. You can't improve something that you haven't accepted you're not good at. Because the things that we work on are the things for which we've identified a gap. But if you're great at everything that you do, why on earth would you try and, um, uh, you know, try and improve something that you're already great at? Um, and so sometimes it's also easy to Give an example like the one that I've just given now, where the example is about something mundane like an Excel spreadsheet. But there are other things that hurt when you confront them and confront the fact that you're not good at them. So I'll give you, I'll give you another example. Um, I, I haven't been good for a really, really long time um, at showing up for people in the sense of like going to attend funerals and weddings and baby showers and i'm just i just haven't been that person um because i'm like no we'll have one-on-one -on -one time me and you whoever you are our friendship um we'll spend time together and it took me learning from two people um and getting feedback from two people to say no no you're actually really bad at this 
and actually you need to do better. Um, when, and so this was me, was it a couple of weeks ago, like three weeks ago, going to a funeral in another province of a friend of my husband whose wife, whose wife's mother had died. Now, I'm just trying to show you how much better I've become and how much growth there's been. Ordinarily, I would never go. I'm like, I don't know you, I don't know your wife, I don't know her mother, but why am I going to the funeral? And I, I was given that feedback to say, no, you actually need to, um, people take a lot of, the way my husband put it was, people take a lot of um, comfort from your presence. They put a lot of meaning and value to you showing up physically and going. So I, it's something that I've been working on. Is it something I'm proud about to say um, I haven't, I haven't always been good at showing up for people? No, of course not. It's not something that I'm proud about, but self-acceptance, this is not my strength. And I know part of the reason is not my strength. And I know none of you guys are going to believe me, but part of the reason is not my strength is that I'm actually an extroverted introvert. I really keep to myself. Um, and I'm only extroverted and draw energy from other people when I'm on stage and when I'm doing work. Otherwise, I'm a very inward focused, inward energy kind of person, very shy. I know you're not going to believe that either. Um, and really just keep to myself most of the time. But I just, I want to just pin this, but I'm, I had to confront something very, that to hear it articulated by other people hurts. Um, but because I realized there's something that I do want to do something about, it's then something that I've been working on. So self-acceptance is the second pillar. Cindy so says, if you don't accept yourself fully, you also rob yourself of a chance to let others in and rob others of showing up for you. And you know what, Cindy so self-acceptance also doesn't always mean you have to fix the thing that you're not good at. Sometimes you're okay with it. The, and I think that, and I, I just want to be clear that I'm not saying that if you are find something um, that you're not good at, that you must automatically go and fix it. But you have to have, it must be a conscious decision that you're saying, I choose to leave this as is. And I choose to live with that as is. And that's not always the case. All right, so that's two pillars um, out of the four that we're going to do. Um, so the third pillar is what uh, I wanted to get to, which is the, pil the pillar of self-management. Now, somebody already uh, was raising, I think it was a comment about um, discipline. Oh, yes. I think it was the question from Huiti Huiti was saying, how do we hold ourselves accountable as we lead ourselves? She tends to procrastinate a lot and change her timelines just because she's the one in a leadership position. Um, and Huiti, I think it's such an honest question and thank you very much for raising and for asking that because I do think that when we're leading ourselves, the fact that we don't, we're not answering to anyone necessarily other than ourselves, it's very easy to be super flexible with the, with, uh, the rules, super flexible with what you committed to do, flex, super flexible about what you, when you're going to do what you said you're going to do. And I have found that for me personally, because I can also pro procrastinate, is that um, I put in place uh, systems and processes that allow me to keep, uh, to stay on track. So for example, I don't like working out. I don't know anybody actually, okay, maybe there are a few um, gym people. I don't like working out. And so in order to stay fit, then I commit to my trainer three times a week and I pay in advance. Like it's a system in place. So it means I need to make a conscious decision to cancel. I must consciously make the wrong decision. And so the neurological process of saying, I'm now going to make a wrong decision is so much harder. I just go, okay, let me just go. Let me just go and survive the next hour and then we'll take it from there. I don't think that without putting that system in place, I would have been able to um, more or less stay on track um, with with my fitness goals abigail says i'm similar and as a result i do have quite deep meaningful relationship i show up where it really matters to us i completely aligned abigail i'm learning though to do it a bit more broadly um and um and especially in communities where people would think that i would never show up to learn to show up in those communities um 
So back to back to self management. So basically, self management. Another word for it is discipline. For me, processes and systems help me stay in place. My calendar is my like most important thing in my life. If it's not in the calendar, it's not getting done. I tell this to my team all the time. So if you were to get a, a peep into my calendar, everything is in my calendar, including when to eat, including when to take a break, including when to make a call, reminders, all my meetings, um, including when to stop working, when to wake up, when to... Because if I don't put that system in place um, and I kind of just let the day go, the probability that I'm actually going to... Um, do the things that I said I'm going to do is very, is very, very thin. Now, there's a big difference between having a calendar that keeps you on track uh, and just having a packed calendar where you're just like going crazy. I've also had to learn to build in breaks because, you know, my home office is at home. My son is here. So I do actually um, want to step out of the office um, more or less when he's having his lunch or before his nap or after his nap so that I can just spend a little bit of time with him as well. And so systems are for me just like the most important uh, thing. Um, the other thing I think to help, um, to help me stay accountable, what I have done is that I, I constantly focus on um, setting myself. So I start big, like what do I want to achieve for the year? Then I go for the quarter. Um, then I go for the month, but every Monday is a clean start to the week. And I don't do my to-do list for the week on the Monday. I do it on the Friday because I'm already thinking about in anticipation of the week ahead, what are the things that, do, that I need to wake up to on Monday in order to get the day, uh, to have a good start to the week and do all the things that need to be done. So I don't wake up on Monday going, oh, what needs to be done? I wake up to a Monday that already has an agenda and things that need to be done. I have found that that works for me. I don't know if it works for everyone, but those are the little ways in which um, I manage myself. It's even small little things like in the social context. If you know that you are lightweight when it comes to drinking alcohol, the, the discipline of just having your drink in a glass of water and making sure that you are doing, you're drinking both. That is in itself is a system you've put in, your pla in place for you that every time you pour a drink, you're going to pour two drinks so that you can drink your alcohol and drink your water. Now I feel like I'm giving alcohol advice, but I'm giving you an example of little things that we, we put in place in order to manage ourselves. Crystal says um, it's important to have a system in place, Shem, because sometimes even though we know what we have to do, we still just don't do those things. And I know that one of the things I need to get better at is that I then, because I put so many systems in place, I have little empathy for people who don't get things done. Because I'm like, that you're not managing yourself, most. If you can't make yourself do something, what are the chances that other people are going to do it because you said they must do it? I mean, for me, it doesn't compute at all. And of course, I'm also a recovering workaholic. And so I have to also remind myself to, to, to put in a break because... If I don't, for me, it's very easy to put my head down, go into my office, put my head down in the morning, come out at night. And so I have to make sure that I do those things that allow me to have the breaks, to lift my head, to walk outside in the grass, just to be um, a little bit more balanced. Um, and even when I'm traveling to build in an extra day or, you know, take an earlier flight, so I've got more time just to chill before I actually have to go to work. But all of those things are systems. If I didn't have the system, it just wouldn't get done because not everything that we do is fun. You know, not everything that we do is like, oh, yay, let's go. Let's go do it. No, it isn't. Um, and so your system is going to be very, very important. Um, then the last thing I wanted to talk about here is what happens when you, you're off track? How do you recalibrate and bring yourself back to get back on track? And what I have found helpful for me is to get out of my head and to almost ask myself the question, if this was somebody else, what is the advice I'd give to them about how do they then um, get unstuck and get moving again? Um, and I re and okay, so don't judge me uh, on this one, but I literally talk to myself. 
right? And I talk to myself as if somebody else was talking to me and I have a full on conversation about, okay, this is what we do. So in a situation like this, the best thing to do is do this, do this, do this, do this. Do this. And I know sometimes, um, so, so the other day I, I was actually talking to myself when I was walking in the mall and this lady actually said to me, she stopped me and she asked me if I was okay. Anyway, I was very okay. I was busy having a conversation with myself about something I needed to prep, prep myself, prep myself up about because I was feeling a bit nervous about it. But that's what I do. Um, and it's important to get out of your own head, almost see yourself as somebody else and, and tell yourself, this is what you need to do. Um, because it's hard to restart when you're feeling stuck. Um, and so it's also a coaching technique that I use a lot with other people that I coach. When a person comes to me and they're like, oh, this is the challenge I'm being confronted with. I need to do this and this and this and this. Just pause and I say to them, okay, if you were me and I was you, what would you say to me? And you know, 90% of the time, that person solves the problem for themselves anyway. And it's hard. I think it's a really important to get out of your head in order to get going again when you're starting to feel stuck. Um, one of the things my son has taught me or having a son has taught me, having a child has taught me is actually the importance of systems and process. Um, I mean, we call it all fancy things. I think we call it, um, we call it a, a routine or whatever that is. But in essence, it's just a system. Um, there are certain things we put in place that must happen all the time at a particular because they set the foundation for us to be able to follow through on the other things that uh, need to do that we need to do. So that was number three. The last one, uh, the last pillar. So the first pillar, remember, was self discovery. The second pillar was self acceptance. The third pillar was self management, and the fourth one I really like is self growth. Now this one's really hard because. We are the ones who are responsible for our own growth. And it's easy to point to like professional things as growth. And that's also growth, right? So, you know, you can, you, you, you can get qualifications, you can get certifications, all of those things are growth. And you can point to them and like, okay, I'm going to manage my learning journey. And that's also growth. But I think the harder growth is the growth that is not academically rooted but it's the growth of you your character um your person um because that's a whole lot harder because remember we used to always talk about the struggle is the way and that in order for you to grow you and you 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 need to break through the current limitation where you find yourself at in order to get to your next best and that breakthrough is often very uncomfortable so um Again, I'm going to use a personal example, something that I struggled with for a very, very uh, long time because I'm an A-type personality. I'm very achievement driven. Um, I like recognition. I like reward. I like winning. I want to be first. Um, I want to be the best. I'm all of those A-type personality things. It was really hard for me to receive feedback, especially if the feedback was you haven't done well. In fact, you know. Um, and it, I really had to, I had to, I had to grow through that because I, I was closing the doors to so many opportunities for growth because I wasn't willing to hear that I wasn't perfect. Um, and I'm so grateful for all the coaching and the mentoring that I've received over time because that is much less of an issue today. But there was a time where it was really hard for me to hear that, oh no, you could have done better. And I think a huge part of it was socialized as a child. I went to a school where, and I think many of our schools were like this, where the top three had to, I were called up in assembly every term to come and receive their certificates uh, for being in the top three in the class. And for me, I was like, if I'm not in the top three, then, you know, then in Genzani school, and what am I doing here? And when I went home, it was re reinforced at home. My mother used to have a thing where she'd say, uh, if you didn't come first, um, she's not really sure what she had sent you to school for. So that was my mission, like to always be first in class, first in the grade, in all of those things. And, and we praise these things on our children, right? You look at it and you go, oh, my child's so smart. And so, but inevitably what it also does is that it closes you off from not, from not seeing progress as something that is actually more important than perfection. Um, it makes you also fearful of failing, 
because um, it is the opposite of winning and it's the opposite of being not seeing that in the failure is the opportunity to learn a new way of doing things. Um, Grace says, letting go of perfection has been my biggest blessing and I have done so much better in my work. It, 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 it is absolutely something that is so hard to do. But this is why I'm saying that these things, these intangible things are so much harder in to 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 grow through than the stuff that we we do we do academically um i once got the feedback um uh from a, a family member that i had the tendency of showing up as a bully uh amongst uh, amongst my sisters because uh just because i was the oldest um i tended to almost speak to them as if i knew everything they just need to do what i tell them to do and life will be fine and of course that came from a place of deep caring not wanting them to make the same mistakes that i had made wanting things to be smoother for them but to hear somebody say this is how you show up and to be able to break through and grow from that was really really hard um today i'm very excited to say that i have a fantastic friendship with my sisters i'm not a second parent to them i'm actually um you know I'm, I'm, I'm a sibling and that has just made our relationship so much better. But to hear that and to be able to grow through that, to break through, to be better on the other side of it is an option of, um, is, is a reflection of what I would call self growth. So San says, I'm so happy. My late father never allowed that pressure on us. I'm so glad for you, Sans, because a lot of us grew up, um, with just, and I think it was, I think it was a function of where we were coming from. Um, just almost like the deep poverty and so on. But it, it does have, you carry the burden of that as an adult that is afraid to fail, an adult that just, you know, uh, wants to be perfect, wants to be recognized, wants to win, wants to be seen. And it takes a lot of growing to actually snap out of all of that and come into the fullness of you by realizing that part of your, your experience and your journey in life is not to be perfect is to be your imperfect self to grow where you can to allow others to help you grow in in some of those ways um and so i'm i i hope that you have just only the best memories um of of your dad as well i mean i say this about my mom now but at the time and on reflection i probably real, realized i would not be where i am without uh, her having shown up like that but there's you know there's a sh light and a shadow to everything in life S certain things are light in your life at a particular point but they become a shadow at a different a different point in your life when you're now carrying the aftermath and the residue of those things in your life so those you know those are the four pillars i wanted to share with you um there were a couple of questions that some people sh uh, shared um uh, Chucky says, how do I build self-discipline? I think we've spoken about that. My answer is systems and processes. There's no other way. People talk about uh, accountability partners and so on. I think in certain instances, like training maybe, but ultimately it must start and end with you as well. Khutu is saying, this is hitting home. Having a fear to fail was once a crippling feeling in my life. And Zappo says, sure, uh, this was such a beautiful, insightful session. Uh, with the leadership crisis in Africa, we need to develop our leadership capabilities as young people. Thank you so much, Ntapo. Um, guys, it is and has been a really interesting session. Somebody says, um, uh, are there any specific habits or daily practices? I think we've spoken about some of those. Um, and somebody says, Sangha says, how do you balance self-leadership with collaboration and teamwork in professional settings? I think when you're able to lead yourself, it's even easier to work with other people in a team. You know, there's, uh, I don't know how many of you guys would have had the experience of syndicate groups. Um, and especially if you're doing a master's program or an MBA in particular, you usually get put into syndicate groups. Uh, and there's always just that one annoying person who's not pulling their weights, who's not... Uh, uh, um, uh, submitting what they're supposed to be submitting when they're supposed to be submitting and just coasting coasting on the coattails uh, on the coattails of other people for me i always just see that as a reflection of poor self-leadership more than anything else because sometimes they have the greatest intention they have the greatest ideas 
um, but it's the follow through. And maybe that's the last point I want to make. I think self leadership is about setting setting goals for yourself, which is the first start of it, but more importantly, following through, doing the things that you said you're going to do, when you said you're going to do it, how you said you're going to do them. And of course, you might pivot along the way, you might change, you might come up with different ideas, you might decide to pull in somebody's help or somebody's input, but are you getting the work done? And this is not work that somebody else has put on you, this is not work that is being hung over your head because somebody else is expecting it, but these are the things that you said you are going to do. And so maybe as I close, I suppose the, the, the question I wanna leave with, with all of you today is, would you, would you be led by you? And if the answer is no, then I think there's a lot of reflection for us to go back to. Um, there might be instances where we're not always the best leaders of ourselves. Um, and that's acceptable because we know that leadership is contextual and we're not always going to show up as leaders in every single context. But I hope that, you know, using this framework of these four pillars, we might take on this year with a just um, a lot more focus on how do we build the muscle of leading ourselves before we build the expectation of leading other people. Uzintle says, Siabunga um, Kulu, very helpful. As a single mom, I'm learning that planning is key and developing a structure or routine helps immensely. I couldn't agree with you more. Umanji Ngele says, such a useful insight. Thank you so much, Nozi. Thank you so much, guys. And thank you for um, uh, joining our Mentorship Monday uh, on our new page. We're really excited about growing this community. Remember, um, this session, including last week's session with Adebola, uh, Williams, which is all about making sure that your personal brand is all well positioned for the year. They're all on YouTube. You can just subscribe um, on our YouTube page uh, and you can watch all of the um, all of the um, sessions that we've had. We've got now 42 in the bag. This is our 42nd episode. So um, we're really, really um, just so grateful for the support and um, for everybody who shows up on a Monday for Mentorship Monday. Have a fantastic end of the week. Uh, lead yourself well uh, this week and lead yourself well this month and lead yourself well this year. For me, it's bye-bye for now and thank you so much for listening and joining me in conversation.